This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, a brief history. At 4 p.m. on the 9th of September, 1513, the armies of England and Scotland came face to face near the village of Branxton in Northumberland. The subsequent brutal battle ended with the death of James IV of Scotland and is known today as the Battle of Flodden. Relations between the two countries had been volatile since the end of the wars of Scottish independence. Just 26 years previously, James IV had led an army into England and besieged Norm Castle. James's marriage to Margaret Tudor in 1502 and the accompanying Anglo-Scottish Treaty had brought a brief period of cooperation, but by Henry VII's death in 1509, it was already under strain. In contrast to his father, Henry VIII was an energetic young man who was passionate about jousting, hunting, and warfare. It was his ambition to establish his military reputation with a war against France. By the end of 1511, he had joined the Holy League against France, and tensions with Scotland were continuing to increase. With the English Parliament reasserting overlordship over their neighbor, James IV agreed to resurrect the old alliance with France. The Franco-Scottish Agreement of 1512 stated that James and Louis XII would declare war on England if the other was attacked. In the summer of 1512, an army commanded by Thomas Gray, Marquess of Dorset, sailed to Spain and joined forces with Ferdinand of Aragon against France. On arrival, they discovered that Ferdinand wanted to reclaim Navarre instead. Stranded in Spain, the English army came close to mutinying, and the expedition returned home a failure. It was deeply embarrassing for Henry, and planning quickly began for an invasion in 1513, to be led by the king. In Henry's absence, Catherine of Aragon was appointed regent, and in case James IV did decide to attack England, Henry left Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey, to organize the northern defenses. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and click Become a Patron for details. All right, back to the show. Fears of a Scottish attack proved to be correct. Louis XII sent French captains to train the Scots in the Swiss mercenary style of fighting with pikes. And on August the 11th, a Scottish herald arrived at Terouan. The herald instructed Henry to return home or James would attack England. Henry refused and instead ordered his wife to begin urgent preparations to defend the realm. James IV led his army into England on the 22nd of August. News reached Surrey at his base at Pontefract on the 25th, by which time the Scottish army was already besieging Norham Castle. Norham fell after six days of siege, and the Scots moved on to take the castle at Etal and Ford. Roads were flooded, and strong winds nearly prevented the Lord Admiral, Surrey's son Thomas, from bringing his fleet and men north. Surrey finally mustered his army near Alnwick on the 4th of September. Further south, Catherine ordered a muster in the Midlands and was preparing to march north, but the distance and weather meant that this secondary army would be of no immediate use. With limited supplies available for a long campaign, Surrey challenged James to a battle to take place on the 9th of September. When he received word that James had accepted the challenge, he moved his army to Wooler, some three miles from the Scottish camp. In Surrey's opinion, near Millfield Plain would be the perfect battlefield. However, it became apparent that James had no intention of abandoning his unassailable position on Flodden Hill. When pressed to say whether he would be descending to the battlefield, James replied that he would not be instructed by Surrey. The English decided to attempt a flanking maneuver and relocate to Branxton Hill, north of the Scottish position. This meant marching some 10 miles north on the afternoon of the 8th of September. Then, on the following morning, they had to march west, cross the River Twill, and march south into position. 
Scottish scouts spotted them as they crossed the river, and James made the decision to move his army to Brankston Hill. He also ordered that his men burn their rubbish, creating a smoke screen. It was not until the Lord Admiral was within a quarter of a mile of Brankston Hill that the English discovered that James had beaten them to their target. With no options left, Surrey took up position on Piper's Hill. The larger Scottish army was split into four main units, possibly with a smaller fifth unit behind the ridge. The English were divided into three main units with a small unit of horse in reserve. A fifth unit, under the command of Sir Edward Stanley, was still making its way to the battlefield. Between the two armies was a wet, boggy dip in the ground. The battle began with artillery fire from both sides. The English had the upper hand due to their lighter, more maneuverable field guns, which forced James to go on the offensive and charge toward the English. At first, the tactic was successful. The right-hand wing of the English army, under the command of Edmund Howard, was quickly routed by the Scottish unit commanded by Lord Home. The English bills were useless against the longer reach of the Scottish pikes, and with his men fleeing, Edmund was only saved by the arrival of Lord Dacre with the English reserve. Lord Home had advanced over the easiest ground on the battlefield, meaning his men could maintain the momentum needed for the Swiss style of pike fighting. The rest of the Scottish army was not so lucky. Charging down the hill, the two central Scottish units were slowed by the boggy ground. With their momentum lost, they abandoned their pikes to fight with swords and daggers. The fighting was frantic, vicious, and bloody, and despite their difficulties, the Scots might have won due to the sheer size of their army. That they didn't was down to two factors. Firstly, Lord Home did not re-engage after breaking the right wing of the English army. Secondly, Edward Stanley's unit arrived and fell on the flank of the Scottish army, just as they were going to charge to the aid of their king. James pressed on, desperately trying to reach Surrey, and was slain just a short distance from the English commander. Sixteen Scottish noblemen and four leading clergymen died alongside James thanks to a no-mercy order issued by the Lord Admiral. Only 1,200 prisoners were taken. Estimates of the number of Scottish dead range from 10 to 15,000 men. Surrey was rewarded for the victory with the Dukedom of Norfolk, forfeited after his father's death at the Battle of Bosworth. His position as one of England's leading noblemen was secured. Although Flodden was not a personal victory for Henry VIII, it enhanced his international reputation. It also neutralized the threat posed to England by the Scots, who now face years of internal instability during the minority of 17-month-old King James V. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.